Our first speaker is Dr. Mike Bradford, scientist emeritus, recently retired from DFO Science Branch. Mike has enjoyed a long and prolific career publishing research on monitoring freshwater science, salmon population dynamics, and so much more. He's a key salmon ecologist in our region, and as a side note, prior to retirement, he helped to develop the terms of reference for the enhanced ecosystem monitoring program that I'm now working with. Dr. Bradford will be starting us off today with a talk on thinking about habitat monitoring. The why sets the stage for what, when, who, and how. And I'll turn to Mike. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about the uh, some of the thinking that might one ought to do when, when designing a re habitat restoration monitoring program. And I want to delve deeply into why we are monitoring a bit more than we normally do, because I think the flow of information from a monitoring program upwards through an organization uh, is really where the learning occurs. And so it does require uh, making sure you thought in advance about that information and how it's going to be used. Next slide. So usually when we're thinking about monitoring habitat, we have some kind of standard questions. <clears throat> Those of us who work in fisheries are often uh, posed the question, how are the salmon doing? And the parallel question that is often asked is, how is the habitat doing? And that, that's that general habitat uh, state of habitat monitoring that's been a desire in the region for, for a long, long time that Chrissy was just talking about. Another area of habitat monitoring that's quite important for DFO, at least, is in the regulatory context of determining whether the measures that developers must take to offset impacts to habitat are working so that there's no overall loss of, of habitat quality or quantity. And a third kind of common question we have is regarding restoration. And as the others this morning have already mentioned, uh, the desire to see whether restoration projects are working is an important question for that's hoped to be answered by monitoring. But we know that monitoring is quite hard to do well, so we need to dig a little deeper into the why. Uh, next question. And I'm going to draw on an advisory process that was done by uh, DFO, I guess almost 10 years ago now, on looking at the monitoring of habitat for habitat compensation. Because a lot of uh, the considerations for habitat monitoring are, are very uh, similar between compensation and restoration. This was a national process in 2012, and the top document there is an overview of that review process that went on. And the lower document is one that I co-authored with uh, Steve McDonald and Colin Lavings, looking at reviewing some of the monitoring that had gone on the Pacific region. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, I suppose, but at least it uh, sums up some of the issues that were identified <clears throat> from the available information at the time. So those are available. And uh, I think we'll try and make a list of publications that we can disseminate so people can dig these up uh, from the web. OK, next slide. <clears throat> in that process, we characterize monitoring in, with using three different tiers. And really, they're not uh, separate uh, levels of effort. There's more of a continuum from simple to more complex. The, the first tier is what we call compliance monitoring. And that was designed to just assess whether the work that was proposed uh, was being done correctly. And the most simplest of seeing if, if uh, the requirements of a Fisheries Act or authorization were being met, for example, or if a contract for doing some restoration work was satisfied. So the metrics involved there are very simple, just the area counts of things, you know, based on a site visit soon after the work was completed. It's useful. If, for program management and also for reporting out if, if an organization needs to make a statements about you know, the amount of habitat restoration that was done. It doesn't provide much in the way of biological insight. The second level of monitoring we call functional monitoring, and it's really the use of relatively simple indicators for assessing function of habitat. That might be a visual assessment. Uh, I see a lot more being done with drones these days to assess habitat, or simple functions of of habitat or ecosystem function. That could be just uh, the depth of the water, the oxygen level, um, the presence of fish visually observed, perhaps. There's different ways of doing that. Uh, you, the documents lay out a bit more of the detail. You can compare your measurements to a reference condition. You know, is the temperature in the right range? Uh, very often, a treatment and control comparison is done where you set up a site that's untreated and, and see if you've uh, how the conditions compare. And 
<clears throat> what is quite useful often is a trend analysis. So you repeat sample over time, sometimes quite a long period of time, and look at the evolution of the restoration or compensation works over time. But the main point is it's that the metrics are fairly simple to do and are easily to repeat. And that addresses the question, the basic question, is the habitat functioning or is the condition improving over time? Finally, the third category or tier that we addressed in, in that review was what's known, what we called effectiveness monitoring. I know that the names of these categories has uh, evolved and people use different names, but uh, still the same continuum. In effectiveness monitoring, we're trying to see whether um, the biological processes, the physical and biological processes in the habitat, how are they are functioning, are they improving, and ultimately what that might lead to in terms of habitat productivity and fish productivity, which often in our region is, is, salmon, is salmon productivity. These tend to be more detailed studies, uh, a more formal scientific design is used, such as before and after comparisons or before and after control and impact, or that's more complex experimental design, uh, multi-year sampling, multi-site, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot more involved in doing these effectiveness uh, monitoring programs. <clears throat> uh, next slide. And as mentioned, monitoring is for learning. And so the kind of um, monitoring program kind of exists along this continuum also of how much we already know. So this, in the cases where we're using a technique, for example, in restoration, where it's relatively unproven or has little documented evidence, then we might put a lot more resources into effectiveness monitoring of that action. So it might be, for example, a research level situation where you pour a lot of effort into a few sites to really unpick what's going on with that restoration technique. As experience and time moves on, the information base grows, you might be able to rely on certain indicators that will be developed from the effectiveness monitoring, for example, surrogates, um, and that would enable more sites to be monitored and perhaps allow for more resources to be put into the doing part, which is, of course, what everybody gets excited about. And then <clears throat> further along the line, when the, the technique is well understood, relatively simple monitoring may be required, or people who can just do the technique without monitoring and be comfortable that. You know, most of the time there's benefits being accrued. So there's this continuum that the monitoring, the spectrum can be applied to depending on the um, uncertainty uh, involved surrounding the, the restoration or habitat activity that's being conquered. Okay, next slide, please. So learning is best achieved by amassing results. And I think this is something that Karen's gonna to touch on in her talk. If you have very detailed scientific studies and that result from effectiveness program, monitoring programs, you know, assess, assembling a, a suite of those would be the, the gold star, I suppose, in terms of providing the most reliable assessment of, of outcomes for a certain restoration technique. Functional monitoring can be informative, even though the, the st individual studies aren't as detailed and the metrics perhaps are a little bit coarser. Uh, often it enables you to collect information from more sites and that can provide a good insight into the effectiveness. And finally, compliance monitoring is not really designed to, for learning, but it does provide insights into program management and the performance of a regulatory or management framework. But bottom line is, you know, it, assessing results in multiple sites is really the key to move forward in terms of learning. Okay. We think about how monitoring results will be used, and I made this rather complicated spaghetti diagram of going from individual projects and how all the feedbacks of monitoring would work in an institutional social structure. So the green squares at the bottom are individual projects and the various arrows uh, kind of indicate the flow of information. Compliance monitoring, for example, is mainly designed for program management audit and the blue arrows on the left. <clears throat> the effectiveness monitoring, as just mentioned, might feed into a technical evaluation of techniques, and that can inform strategies for, for uh, restoration programs and presumably would contribute to overall uh, ecosystem recovery. Functional monitoring is ideally fun suited for state of habitat uh, reporting, but also would inform uh, program 
uh, adjustments <clears throat> and, and contribute to learning. But uh, the idea here is that each um, type of monitoring feeds into a higher level evaluation. The information is used, compiled, assessed, and then to varying degrees informs the program and the community of restoration uh, practice as it evolves over time. So it's complicated, but it's useful to go beyond the individual sites and think about how your information collected from a monitoring program can inform uh, at a higher level when, when studies are amassed or results from projects are amassed. Next slide. One way to guide monitoring is to use a tool that has been used by the DFO's Habitat program for a long time. And these are the pathways of effects uh, models. And these are just qualitative models designed to link uh, activities to effects through the ecosystem, ultimately to uh, endpoints. So this is one taken for um, <clears throat> land clearing, land-based activities from DFO's website. And at the top of the diagram um, are the activities, the things that alter habitat. So we're dealing with someone who wants to clear land, for example. And uh, the squares at the top indicate the kind of activities, operating machines, removing vegetation, that sort of thing. And then the arrows and the, the lines flow down to different components of the ecosystem that might be affected by that activity. And then the, continuing down to the ovals at the bottom, the habitat endpoints or the, the things in the water, for example, that are affected by that, that sequence from the activity down through the ecosystem processes. So we can adapt this for, for uh, thinking about restoration monitoring. So if we go to the next slide, now, I just made a real simple diagram that's somewhat analogous to the previous one, but here we're dealing with things going in the other direction. So imagine a riparian planting activity, um, the ecological processes that be impacted by that. And this is just done up quickly. It's not meant to be comprehensive by any means, but um, it's showing that, you know, there are certain things that are uh, hypothesized at least to improve as a result of riparian planting, more organic inputs, more shade, bank stability should be improved. And that leads to changes in habitat conditions, so in the green, uh, more wood, more food, temperature stability, reduction in sediment, this sort of thing. Then if we continue on down, there are uh, then those tied to consequences for fish populations. And when we think about fish, it's good, useful to break down from simply the number of fish to the life processes for the fish and how they are affected by these individual habitat related changes. So um, <clears throat> temperature stability, uh, food inputs could affect growth and survival. Um, it was an error in the wrong place there under insect and leaf inputs that should be over to growth and survival. Anyway, uh, large wood often increases complexity and improves the habitat capacity could lead to an increase in abundance. Uh, reduction in sediment might improve uh, egg survival and the gravel. So the can pull apart the linkages um, resulting from a restoration activity and uh, how, it, how it moves towards um, presumably improvement, improvement in salmon productivity. Next slide. With all of those linkages then, we can think about ways to monitor and we have to be cognizant of biological and sampling considerations when doing that monitoring. And I'm sure everybody is when they're thinking about habitat monitoring. The ecological responses vary considerably in speed. So some things respond quite quickly uh, when you restore connectivity or flow in a river or creek. Uh, <clears throat> fish populations and river populations often respond very quickly. But other, other things will take a much longer time, whether it be waiting for riparian vegetation to grow or upslope processes to change over time. So those ecological responses are, will vary considerably in, uh, in, in their speed, and that affects you know, the effort that's going to be needed for monitoring. The other consideration is that some things are easier to monitor than others, and uh, things that you can measure, often the physical processes or uh, trees and things like that that don't move much, or you can gain pretty good estimates of what's at your site uh, relatively simply, but uh, other things are much harder. Uh, sediments and high flows vary considerably in vertebrates, fish, Often you need many years of sampling to get good estimates. So that's an important consideration then taking that uh, 
pathways effects diagram apart. So next slide. So here's a pathways effects, the previous one I just showed for riparian planting, and I've just kind of tried to indicate on, whoops, there we go, uh, forward, for, there, perfect. Uh, so I've tried to show here different types of monitoring, so compliance, functional, and effective monitoring, and the stars are just to indicate the effort and challenge, I suppose, with each of those. and. I've just provided a few uh, potential metrics that one might use for this kind of activity. So the compliance F metric would be the stem density, how many plants are planted uh, in this project. Some simple uh, functional monitoring of riparian cover uh, and a visual assessment of uh, bank stability might be possible to get an idea of what's going on. But as you move down through the diagram, things get to be more, much more difficult to sample and re obtain reliable estimates. And when you're down into the sort of salmon abundance, you know you're looking at generally at a fairly significant sampling program over a fairly long period of time. And, you know, all of these items at the bottom of the panel are also subject to factors outside of the actual individual restoration project, which makes assessment much more difficult. So by and large, um, monitoring metrics when you flow from the top to the bottom and those pathways effects tend to get more complicated and more challenging as you go along. And so uh, one has to think about um, at what level can you be satisfied with the monitoring results, what variables you know are sufficient for the information needs that you have and and thinking ahead about how what your information is going to be used for. Because if you wade too far down the you could end up <clears throat> taking on some monitoring activities that are maybe difficult to sustain or carry out with the kind of rigor that you need to be informative moving forward. Next slide. So I want to provide a few examples just to show uh, some successful habitat monitoring programs that use functional and, and effective dosimetrics. And there's quite a diversity in the duration and intensity of sampling in these, but um, just to give some ideas. So. Next slide. So the first example comes from Northern California and it's uh, dealing again with riparian development. And so the, the four figures, uh, photographs here show a site where over a course of 12 years, a site in, in the grasslands, uh, rangeland was uh, planted and then you can see the riparian growth as you go through time. And so what these uh, researchers did is they gathered information from existing products, uh, projects rather, and the projects are all different ages, and so that when you visit a project at, a at the same point in time, but they are of different ages, the, the riparian development would be in a different stage. Next slide. So that's called a space-time substitution design, and <clears throat> what it allows you to do is look at the progression of riparian metrics without having to be at the same site for quite a long period of time. And so they had, unfortunately, the figure is not very clear, but they uh, had 102 sites that they assessed, and they varied in age from zero to, I think, 40 years old. And you can see, you know, the data show a pretty clear trend. It takes a couple of decades for a lot of the metrics to be fully uh, reach their maximum values. And uh, <clears throat> And, and, and so, you know, it does imply that you do need to monitor the kind of this kind of work for quite a long time before you really get an understanding of where you're going to end up at. But the important thing, too, is that their simple metrics cover and stem density. They did collect a lot of other information, but these proved to be useful, uh, could be collected relatively easily uh, and allow for, for revisiting over a long period of time if needed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The next example is a re very recent study published on riparian, again on the riparian enhancement in the Columbia River Basin in the U.S. So here they're they're looking at a uh, post treatment design um, where they went to restoration sites that had already been constructed that were at least a couple of years old, found a control site control site nearby that represented sort of the pre treatment condition and collected a, a set of variables from both sites. What I found interesting in this study is analogous to some of the discussions we've just had and we'll, and we'll probably have all day is um, 
the challenge in terms of information. So they had a database of over 700 projects and um, the database contained very little information that would allow the researchers to go and do these follow-up monitoring studies. They contacted project proponents to get more information. They were able, from the 720, they got 235 where they were able to reach, get some information from proponents. But when they finally got down to the point of selecting study sites, there are only 40 sites that were suitable for sampling just because of the lack of information, inability to find the projects, uncertainty about how old they were, what the details were of the restoration that was conducted. So this is kind of the situation I think that everyone faces is that the absence of this kind of project documentation makes it much more difficult to learn about what's happened to these things over time. And in the end, they wanted to do a random sample of restoration projects, but they had to take every site they could find. Only 6% of the original project database had suitable sites for, for their follow-up monitoring. Next slide. I won't go into all the details. <clears throat> there were some significant changes. Uh, there are also a lot of things that didn't change much relative control. So when you go across all projects, the, the results of the restoration wasn't overwhelming. Of course, there were some, there were significant improvements, but not so much. And that's often the case when you're starting out in a restoration, you know, some, some sites work out well and some don't. But what was useful in this study, and I think it's an important uh, <clears throat> way to look at things is that um, they collect a lot of other information and then did some statistical modeling to figure out what were the factors that led to success. And um, what you can see in the diagram there with the lines, you know, there are certain variables or factors that seem to be um, ones that were, would contribute to a greater likelihood of a project being successful, getting a positive outcome from the restoration. So it's an example of, um, again, a large number of sites, a little over 40, and collecting information that allows one to tease apart the factors that lead to success, you know, at a regional scale. Next slide. Now, that, the final example I had was uh, from work that I've been involved in for almost my whole career, shockingly. And this is looking at um, the effects of flow restoration in the Bridge River, river near Lillooet, that's controlled as a hydroelectric project. And uh, this is an example of a very detailed effectiveness monitoring uh, with fish as the endpoint. There are multiple flow releases that were done, set up in an experimental design. Um, there is in very intensive monitoring that we have 26 years of data. Uh, next slide. And this figure, which is complicated, but it's just designed to show these are uh, uh, annual estimates of fish abundance of four different categories in the Bridge River done by an extensive electrofishing survey. And the color bands represent the different flow regimes um, over the course of that time period. And you can see, this is the point I'm making earlier, that estimating fish abundance is hard, takes a lot of effort. The vertical thin lines are the error bars for each annual estimate. And you can see that the points jump up and down as we know fish populations do. So lots of variability in the data. And so you need a lot of data to be able to tease apart uh, effects of habitat restoration. <clears throat> to summarize, next slide. We were able in this experiment to come up with a relationship between the abundance of juvenile salmon and the flow regime during the summer. So if you look on the top curve, there is kind of a peak in this relationship um, that provides some useful guidance for setting flow regime, at least for this one river. But enormous amount of effort to extract this relationship. It's, you know, it's proportional to the consequences, I suppose, in the sense that it affects the regulation and operation of this hydro project. But to just kind of indicate the challenges associated with modern fish populations. Um, and again, this, this was done at the whole river level. Next slide. <clears throat> so a few final comments. Um, I think it's important to think about your frame of reference for habitat monitoring. Um, if you're focusing on ecosystem restoration, you might focus your monitoring on some of those ecological processes, and you're relying on the so-called field of dreams hypothesis, where if you set up the conditions, uh, fish will take, uh, make use of those improved uh, conditions for their complete their life cycle. Um, 
we, many of us, uh, I know, uh, many of us focus on salmon, not everybody. Um, and if we're trying to make the linkage between habitat activities and salmon, that does require significant more effort and careful thought about whether that's going to be effective. Next slide. As I mentioned, if you think about how your information is going to be used, it can help you to uh, find indicators that are going to be informative, but are doable. And that's really important. Uh, finding that balance between what you're able to do, how informative it will be, how long it will take, how much effort, how much expertise. Um, those are the kind of considerations that you have to use. And finally, um, obviously, centralized data management analysis is critical for this overall learning for the restoration program. And finally, next slide. What I call the mushy middle of sampling, and what I haven't shown in this talk are, are studies in which the results were ambiguous. So there are a lot of habitat monitoring studies that yield uninformative results. And my impression is that is the result of trying to do effectiveness monitoring, but not putting enough effort into it. So in this little figure, I've shown intensity of effort on the horizontal axis and the value of information. The green line represents some of those simple functional monitoring. You don't get ultimately the level of detail that you might get from an effective monitoring program, but you get useful stuff with a modest effort. But if you're going to go for some of the effectiveness monitoring, and you don't put the effort in, you just end up with unreliable results. You really do have to put a lot of effort in for effectiveness monitoring to be useful. So avoid that mushy middle of sampling when you're thinking about your design. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Sorry, I muted myself, uh, all this technology, and I still can't use it. Uh, I have a question for you, but before I go to it, I'm just going to uh, remind people that are, are participating watching the session today that if you want to pose questions to any of our speakers, either while they're talking or in advance of the panel session uh, before our lunch break, uh, the, we're using a tool called Slido, slido.com. Uh, the, the, the code is uh, restoration. You can see it on the bottom banner of the screen. You can do it either on your computer or on your, on your cell phone, whatever works for you. So feel free to send those questions in. And uh, we've got a, a team here that will be receiving those and, uh, and moderating them. And Mike, I've just got one question for you that you can respond to now, maybe briefly. And then, and then if it's appropriate, we can get into it in more detail in the panel session. But uh, as you were, Concluding with that, that avoid the mushy middle and recognizing that we've got a bunch of people watching. There's, there were over 200 people logged in last time I looked and I think over 400 registered for today. Um, it seems daunting. Like you're talking about monitoring you know, results, uh, 20 years worth of monitoring to know if, if you really got something as simple as better stabilized stem count or something like that. You're talking about pathways of effects, uh, looking at effectiveness parameters. Uh, what what is the the general thought on guidance for the restoration community when you know we're thinking about uh, a lot of small entities, a lot of local organizations, local groups, um, entities that are trying to do a whole bunch of things, and restoration might just be one of them. And uh, I, I'm I'm kind of thinking if if I was in those those kinds of seats, I might be going. I don't know if I can commit to a twenty year monitoring project for you know, a $5,000 uh, uh, small habitat repair or something like that. So what kind of perspective or advice might you share uh, for that kind of context? And maybe just, you know, a, a couple of quick thoughts now and we can get into it more in the panel session. Yeah, sure. So I think the, the most important and significant, or one of the important things that came out of this review and the review that I did back then is people have trouble finding the projects uh, years later. And I think that uh, individual groups, if there's a system that allows, especially these days, really careful geolocation of the projects and, a, you know, as detailed as possible description of the work that was done. And if that is banked, archived, then I can see, you know, a lot of these uh, studies that I talked about, it's a different group of people have gone back and done the evaluation five and 10 and 20 years later. But as long as there's a, the ability to locate the project and 
have some understanding of what the work was done at the time it was done. And I think, you know, perhaps a, a, maybe a, a specialized teams that focus, focuses on the evaluation can come back over the course of time and begin to track them. But it's more like, you know, just the very simple uh, thing of being able to locate where the project is and what it was. Is, it seems to be the key to start things off. All right. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks for starting us off today, Mike.